Welcome to a special offering by Conversations with a Wounded Healer, the Burnt Out Practice Owner. This series will discuss the current state of group practice ownership, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll hear current and former practice owners' tales of glory and woe as we attempt to answer the ultimate question, why do we do this to ourselves? And we wanna hear from you too. What have been your biggest moments of struggle or triumph? What are questions you want us to explore? I'm your host, Sarah Bueno. I owned and operated my practice Head Heart Therapy for 10 years before selling in 2023. Ownership was an equally grueling and rewarding experience for me. And I now spend my time helping current practice owners find balance for themselves. Join us between releases of Conversations with a Wounded Healer for this special series. Hello, welcome to the Burnt Out Practice Owner. I'm so glad you're here today. Oh my God, thank you, friend, for being here. We're going to have another special episode today that doesn't even feature a practice owner. Oh, dun, dun, dun. We're going to talk to another employee. But first, let me tell you how you can support the podcast. Many ways, because this, this is a little indie thing. Even though I've been doing the podcast for five years, it's this all like self-produced stuff with my amazing team, the Creative Imposter Studios, and your support is super appreciated. You can rate and review this podcast. So whether you know it or not, this is a special series embedded in my podcast, The Conversations with a Wounded Healer. And you can go to ratethispodcast.com slash wounded healer to rate and review the podcast. We're also doing a little giveaway. If you're a regular Wounded Healer fan, you can snap a screenshot of your of your review, send it to me. You get entered into a drawing to get some time with me and Anne. It'll be great. So you can do that. You can rate or review the podcast, send this to a friend. I really think that the conversations that I'm having on this series can be really supportive of practice owners and employees alike. And so share this with someone you love or share it with somebody you hate. I don't know, but share it with someone. And then lastly, if you want to hire me, I am consulting with group practice owners on various things. What really I'm good at is a lot of the personnel stuff and the HR things that are like person based, right? So creating culture, you know, like getting feedback from the management team and the regular team, like those sorts of things, training, all that sort of stuff. So that's what I'm really good at. So hire me if you want some help and you want to support the podcast. All right. On to today's guest. So last Burnt Out Practice Owner episode, which we're lovingly calling BOPO. So the last BOPO episode was Rowan Tree Counseling run by Andy Baumgartner. We had Andy and Nadia talking about their experiences, right? And a lot of it was actually Nadia really leading the conversation. And I hope everybody enjoyed that viewpoint because I think it was super duper important. And I also put out a call to, I wanted to find a therapist who is fully licensed and who's decided to stay in group practice rather than go out on their own. A lot of people are choosing to go out on their own right now, which is awesome. Like, go do it. If you want to be a business owner, go for it. But there are a lot of people who don't want to be a business owner. And I wanted to hear that perspective from somebody who really values the group practice model and wants to stay and be a part of that. Because truthfully, if those people begin to no longer exist, then group practices are not going to be what we hope that they can be. I mean, it's going to be a very different thing when it's when you're hiring just all new people versus people who have some clinical experience and can supervise and all that sort of stuff, right? So I wanted to know, like, what makes these people tick? And what's important to these people to figure out, like, how do group practice owners not only attract these people to their practices, but also keep them around, right? How do they want to be treated? What is it that's important to them? And so Cassandra reached out to me and I'm really excited that she did. And she was like, yeah, let's talk about this stuff. And we had an amazing conversation. I'm probably going to tap Cassandra in the future to, you know, get their take on employee relations because everything they said was really smart. So listen, practice owners, and really take it in because these are the people that we need to be serving as practice owners. So Cassandra Greenwald, LCSWCACADC, she slash they is a therapist, writer, maker, relationship builder, and connector. First raised on the East Coast and then watered and grown in the picturesque Pacific Northwest, currently settled in the great city of Chicago, 
Cassandra works hard every day to be the queer, feminist, anti-capitalist, social justice warrior of conservative nightmares, which is probably one of the best bios I've ever read on this podcast. So congratulations, Cassandra. All right. And everybody else, enjoy this wonderful conversation with Cassandra Greenwald. Hey there, therapist. How you doing? If you're like a lot of people out there, maybe you need a little bit more support than usual. Well, I've got you covered. I'm currently running two groups that I plan to run again in the fall of 2024. So add your name to the wait list to be notified as soon as info is available. First is the Burnt Out Practice Owner Support Group for group therapy practice owners. We'll focus on the emotional component of business ownership while building trust and connection with other practice owners. We'll explore topics such as boundary setting, feeling underappreciated, overwork, and find ways to reconnect with our agency. And you'll also have the support of other practice owners when challenges arise within your business. Next is the Authentic Leaders Group. It's here to help you become the authentic and wholehearted leader you aspire to be. Join me on an eight-month journey of self-discovery and leadership mastery, where you'll enhance your leadership skills and forge meaningful connections with fellow therapists who are committed to their own growth and the betterment of the therapy field. For the Burnt Out Practice Owner waitlist, go to www.headheartbiztherapy.com slash burnt out. Make sure you've got the T and B-U-R-N-T-O-U-T. And next is the Authentic Leaders Group waitlist at www.headheartbiztherapy.com slash authentic dash leaders dash group. Hope to see you soon. Hello, Cassandra Greenwald. Welcome to the Burnt Out Practice Owner. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's super great to be here. Really excited to talk today. Really glad that you're offering this series specifically for all the folks out there. Yeah, yeah. And your voice, I think, is going to be a really great contribution to this topic, this series. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Thank you for giving me some space to share some stories and a little bit of wisdom that I might be able to offer and maybe, you know, ask some good questions, you know. Yeah. I don't think of this as like the end all answer or anything like that. Like, let's just keep this conversation open. Exactly. Cool. Perfect. Well, why don't you start by telling folks a little bit more about you and what you're doing in the world? Sure. Well, I am uh, what they call a non-traditional. <laughs> I was a non-traditional grad student, which just meant I was much older when I figured out what I wanted to be when I grow up, which is a therapist. It was maybe the second point in my life where I had kind of hit a wall of like, I can't go anywhere in this particular corporate America sort of job. I was an editor and a writer in a, different capacities. And I really love working with words and communication and language. And I think that makes that transitions well into therapy. Totally. But I just kind of hit that point that I think a lot of folks hit in this is pre pandemic, even just like not feeling satisfied, not having anywhere else to go um, and starting to feel like, oh, I've always been interested in healthcare and uh, then just having my own personal experience of therapy and being like, wow, this shit works. So, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, having some folks around me encouraging me to explore. And then a wise social worker once said to me, just ask the question, have you thought about social work? And I was like, no. And it was like, bing. Yep. So I went, <laughs> yep. Yep. So left a, you know, well paying job and decided to just kind of start like entry level in, you know, healthcare for marginalized folks and then a case management in housing and homelessness. And then I was surrounded by other social workers who were like, you should go to school. And so I was like, okay, I should probably go to school. And <laughs> like I said, I'm really, really thrilled that I figured out what I wanted to be when I grew up. But, you know, I was like 40 ish when that happened. My so husband's saying, never. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. You know, there's a deep personal connections to this work, I think, with a lot of therapists, you know, the personal is political. I mean, all of the stuff that everybody says, but, you know, I do consider this my life's work. It's the hardest job I've ever done and the most rewarding. So I'm always excited to come to work, less excited to do things like notes right, right. or juggle my calendar, but always excited to do the work. Yeah. And you're at Rowan Tree. I am. I'm a recent addition. Came here right at the very end of 2023. Love it here. Just the values and the mission just aligns with who I am. And I love being around other folks who have the same values and are dedicated to the mission as well. It's great to have your personal and like professional values align with the people you're surrounded by. Absolutely. Well, let's start with the original 
question that brought you here, because I, I put out some questions to the general Facebook group, wanting to hear from some different voices rather than just like practice owner after practice owner. And the, the biggest question was, why would people with their full clinical license stay in a group practice? That's a great question. And, you know, something that I, when I had figured out that it was time to leave where I was previously, you know, there were a lot of different internal and external voices, I think, that said, like, just go on your own. You can, you might as well. Why would you, you know, that's the question. Why would you give a portion of your, the money you make to somebody else? And, you know, I see it, it, it is a business transaction, but it's also like an investment in my own professional development. The, time that my practice owner, my clinical director, and the admin team spend on billing and marketing and just keeping the lights on and all that, that's time that I don't, I don't have to do that. And so that means I get to do more professional development and more trainings. I get to network with people. I get to build more relationships and coordinate care for my clients and learn how to be a better supervisor. All of the things that are important to me that make this work sustainable. Because for me, you know, seeing like 25, 30 clients a week, that's not sustainable for yeah. me. I don't thrive at, at those numbers. So I give, <laughs> I give my clinical director a portion of my earnings. And in return, I get an office space. I get an admin support. I get professional development. I get mentorship from my clinical director too, because I thrive with other people. I, f I figured that out. I thought I was an introvert and then I went to grad school and I figured out that I actually thrive connecting with mm. people. So that's what I need. The idea of me alone in my house five, six, seven days a week, just grinding away and then doing all the billing and all that stuff. That sounds really terrible to me. <laughs> so I may get there eventually. Yeah. <laughs> I may, you know, I may in a few years, five years, 10 years, whatever, I may decide that, you know, I want my own shop. But right now I want the goodies you know, I, I want all that professional development and, and connection and time for that. I don't want to be working 24 seven because I'm on hold with Blue Cross or I'm, you know, figuring out my next marketing thing or doing like LLC paperwork. And like, all that stuff sounds like a nightmare. To me. <laughs> I'm just like, please take my money, take it. I don't want it. I would rather be doing other things. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's yeah. funny because I'm, I'm helping people set up their private practices right now because I, I do a little presentation for a little. I do a presentation for NISW on building a private practice. And so a bunch of them wanted to like stay together and keep like working. And so it's funny. So we were yeah. starting to like list out some of the things that you need to pay for up front. Like you need to pay for the LLC. You need to pay for an accountant who's going to set that up for you. Electronic right. medical record system, rent, like, you know, all of these things. And it's starting to click for some of them, <laughs> recognizing like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, this is what my previous job had done for me that I didn't really right. think about how much this was going to cost, you know, all of that sort of thing. And so I'm guessing part of it is like the wisdom of your age, right? Knowing that like businesses <laughs> cost money to run instead, you know, right? <laughs> right, right. Thank you for saying businesses cost money because that's the thing right now at this point, I don't want to own a business. Yeah. Like I want to be a therapist. Yeah. So, and I know that it's possible. A lot of people do both and do it well. Great for them. Right now, I don't feel like I could devote the energy and my capacity to the business part without getting like super cranky about it. And then what's left, you know, what do I bring to my clients then if I'm feeling completely tapped out because of paperwork yeah. and money, right? And sweating all that money. Yeah. So, the, right. Wh wh whenever I decide I want to be a business owner, giddy up, right? Yeah. Like that's... <laughs> But for right now, I don't want to own a business. So yeah. And I thought about it a lot, obviously, you know, when I was moving on from the, the previous place, it seemed like sort of like a no brainer. And I, you know, as I was looking before I found Andy at Rowan Tree, you know, I was like, well, if I have to do it, I'm going to do it because I, I had all these people, you know, I had a caseload full of people who were like, we want to keep working with you. And I was like, yeah, me too. But Hold, Hold on. on. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's not instantaneous. There's so much bureaucracy, mm -hmm. right? Like insurance and, and IDFPR mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, lest this become a rah-rah group practice owners, we need to talk about some of the shit, right? So what, I mean, I think this is probably... This is me. Literally. <laughs> literally. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
literally rolling. Maybe the <laughs> good a good entry point because because we talked about this before we started recording. This is not about you shit talking previous practice owners, but. I right. think you no, have a lot to not. offer in terms of what do practice owners need to know that they're missing? Because we're talking on the group practice Facebook, how do we retain people, right? right. How right. how do we keep people staying? And obviously the answer is different for everyone, but from your perspective, yeah. right? What works and what doesn't? Yeah, no, great question. I made the, it was a joke, not a joke to someone I worked with previously that if you want to profitable business, like open an ice cream store in July. My understanding is that therapy practices aren't huge money makers, right? Like you're not going to get your second and third houses. And I don't want to sound like high and mitre, or but like, I think you should be doing this because you want to do therapy and you want to like foster and nurture new therapists and therapists who are in the field and build a business that reflects your values, mm -hmm. right? You should not be doing this because you need people to make money for you. Well, let's and, pause and right there. Just pause right there <laughs> because, and I'm I'm saying to the people who are listening to this, thinking about starting a group practice, I know that your number one reason is passive income. I will say it again and I will scream it to the rooftops. There is nothing passive about the income that's made in group practice. Yes, you don't have to be doing the direct clinical service as the practice owner, but you will not be passive. You will be working harder no. than you've worked before. Go on, Cassandra. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. Well, and that's what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. All of that work, yeah. that, that's the work that I don't want to do. And that's the work that the practice owners right. do, right? So I think, and I, obviously, therapy has changed exponentially like 2019 to now yep. or even 2015 to wherever we start the yeah. clock but especially with you know all of us <laughs> the ongoing human experiment of the collective trauma of a global pandemic ongoing mm -hmm. and everybody being like oh shit we need therapy and therapists being like we're gonna do it mm -hmm. right and i know like i you know you talked to my clinical director Andy, who said like, you know, during like peak quarantine, peak pandemic times, like, you know, I was seeing like 25, 30, 35 people a week just because there were so many people who needed it. And then it just was like, oh, I can't do this. But it's shifted now. And the, you know, the great resignation, I think people have a lot of different attitudes about work in general. And so we're in a moment about work. I mean, workers are striking everywhere. And this is like, this is me saying, yes, let's be in a moment about work. But I think what I want in a in a like at a practice owner is like as much as you can being nimble to the ever shifting dynamics and having a long term vision. Like, where do you want to go, even if it's just next year, five years? Because like you can't build the plane while you're flying it. You need to have Except some kind of direct. That's how it works, though. I hate to break it to you. I hate I to break it to you because I'm th I'm listening and I'm like, I had a vision and it was completely unrealistic. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and then, but to have the, like, to hopefully, to, right. To, and you have supportive people in your lives, you know, networks of people who are also in it together, where you can all sit around and say, shit, this is not yeah. working the way we thought we have to pivot. How do we do that? And also like, I mean, this is me. I don't know that every employee is going to feel this way, but I'm always like, use me. You know, you don't have to show me how all of the sausage is made. But if, if, there's like big picture stuff, like let's dive in. If you want to do these things, but you don't have the money, how can we get that money? Like, you know, let's let's write a grant or something. Like, let's figure it out because, and I think that's probably very hard for practice owners is like, how much transparency do you want to give to your employees? Like, hey, I'm really sweating it because, you know, Aetna isn't paying like they usually do. And so we're behind on a lot of our stuff versus like, you know, I as an employee don't necessarily need to know that. But if you want to think about other ways to bring income into the practice that isn't just how many sessions can each therapist do, let's get some, you know, <laughs> me, the general, like get some people in your practice who want to think big picture with yeah. you. That's, that's what I think. Two things to that. It's funny that you say transparency because that's what we, Andy and Nadia and I talked about pretty in depth. And what I've been floating, I know this sounds like so 
it can sound patronizing if he goes in the wrong ear, but essentially holding the practice owner as the parent and the employees as the child. And what mm-hmm. Andy said so beautifully was, just like a parent-child relationship, you're not going to tell your kid like, oh, we're having problems with money right now, so I can't buy these things at the grocery store. But you can say something right. like, hey, we're going to go to this food bank and get some extra food because this is, you know, th- we're just doing this differently right now. Right. And as a child grows, they can tolerate more complexity. And so she has noticed right. the longer a person has been there, the more that they are able to sort of demonstrate a holding of the big picture. She's able to be more transparent. Right. And I found that in my in my experience as well. So I think I think you're exactly right. right. And this bumps up against the notion that I think a lot of employees are coming in with that everything should be fair and completely transparent. And it's like Mm. what one person needs is so different from what another person needs. Like, you know, some employees are extremely fearful and cannot tolerate hearing that there's any sort of potential problem, right? Because then they think, do I need to be looking for another job? But what I heard from Nadia right. and what I'm hearing from you today is that what makes you feel safer is feeling like you do have an understanding of this. And so I hear yeah. the practice owner really needs to, again, I love the word nimble, be nimble to respond to different employees in different stages in different ways. And frankly, right. that's a lot of holding. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's, and, and, and so appreciate the parent child analogy too, because I'm also like, it depends on your. <laughs> Depends on your upbringing whether you heard we don't have enough money to go yeah. to the I, yeah. that is <laughs> another discussion for another day, yeah. perhaps. Just in, you know, Wait, are you a parentified child you know? too? OMG, I bet all of us <laughs> yeah. are. <laughs> yeah, I can neither confirm right. nor deny. Right. This is a public right. this is a public setting. But you know, and that's like it's funny too, because not to like digress too much, but you tend to think that those of us who come to this work and those of us who come to certain aspects of this work. Like I know you focus on addiction in a lot of your work and so do I, and that, you know, we're there for certain reasons, you know, so that parentification piece. Right. And yeah. And I'm thinking too, me at 40 something years old, having some experience as a therapist, I have different needs than say someone who's right out of grad school or even three, four, five years out of grad school like me, but also 30 years old, right? Like, so that's a little bit different to hear, hey, we can't give you your professional development stipend this month because we don't have it, you know? I might take that a little bit differently than than someone else. Do you know what's just around the corner? It's Anne's anniversary being part of Conversations with a Wounded Healer. And we are celebrating the anniversary with a giveaway. For anybody who wants to write an Apple podcast review between March 6th and April 24th of 2024. So go to Apple Podcast, whether it's on your phone or your laptop, search for Conversations with the Wounded Healer, click on the show and scroll down until you see ratings and reviews. Tap write a review and tell us what you think about the show. Then you'll screenshot your review and email it to me at sarah at headheartbiztherapy.com. I know you're thinking, what are the giveaways already? Well, very exciting. You will be entered into a drawing to win one hour sessions with both Anne and me. Anne will give you a choice between a private yoga class or a travel consultation session. And with me, you can choose between a one hour business coaching session or a Reiki session. Submissions must be received by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time on April 24th. The winner will be announced on social media on May 1st, and Anne and myself will reach out to you to schedule your sessions. So please enjoy our anniversary giveaway and celebrate our little Anne Remy. Well, and the other thing that I was thinking as as you were talking about this is I keep realizing I'm in this like defensive practice owner space. So I'm trying to like hold them more equally now. But oh. practice owners need to recognize the skills of their employees and employees yeah. need to help us by putting those on the table. Because what I'm hearing from you is mm. you want to get your hands dirty on some level. You don't want to hold yeah. the responsibility, but you want to be part of making that sausage. Right. And right. I think. <laughs> Again, to sort of like just point out what I feel like I'm seeing a lot right now with some of the newer clinicians is 
I don't want to know how the sausage is made. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I want the sausage to be prepared for me and have it in a beautiful omelet right. with a garnish on the side. Right. And again, I think that probably is based on your age and experience of recognizing mm. like what you want for yourself and what you have to offer. Yeah, right. like what... This is probably just like Gen X old people yelling at clouds. But do you have any <laughs> thoughts for clinicians who aren't really holding up their part of the bargain, right? Because this is a job. This mm -hmm. isn't a family, right? Right, right. I think it is almost like a work style, work ethic kind of thing, like and not throwing anyone under the bus. But what happens is sometimes it, just from what my experience is that when you give a portion of your earnings to the practice, then sometimes there's this idea, it's like, well, you know, what am I getting out of it? And so I think both sides are saying the same thing, mm -hmm. just in different ways. Like, to me, if you're the kind of therapist who you just want to like show up, see your clients and like go out the door. And like, if you see your colleagues at the office, great. If you're virtual, like if you want sort of that like independent contractor feel, like find the practice that can offer yeah, you that. Yeah. And the same thing, like someone like me, like I would die. <laughs> like, right. I'm, all right. That's an exaggeration. <laughs> but I would not thrive. I don't thrive. I've, I've been in those situations where it's just like, there's very little collaboration or camaraderie or it's not fostered super well. And so you wind up feeling very isolated, which PS, I think is in general, this job can be pretty isolating, mm -hmm. especially if you're doing the majority of work remote. But even if you're not, can't exactly go home and talk about what you did at work. And so you have your peeps to lean on and things like that, but it can be isolating. So that's the part, that's another kind of what I was trying yeah. to get at. And like, why are you in a practice when you're clinically licensed? It's like, I need other people to help me do this work. But other people are not like that. They're like, nope, I'm just going to show up. I'm going to see my clients. I'm going to leave. I don't care what the office looks like. I don't care about what we're doing. I don't want any team events. Great. But I think that when you're knocking on the door of group practices or when group practice owners are trying to get people in those positions, there needs to be, that's where the transparency is. This is a practice where you're left alone, right? right? People who work independently will thrive. Or if, if it's a practice like here, like where it's like, we collaborate a lot. There's like, you know, team meetings and consultation and group chats and like, you know, and people are involved as much as they want to be involved in. But it's more of a given that, that that involvement is there. So figuring that out. So I was like, okay, good. I, I chose well. <laughs> this is this is good. Because then you'll have people being miserable saying, like, if there isn't, those needs aren't being filled, right. then it's like, they're taking like, what, like 40, 50% of my earnings. And what am I getting out of it? Barely any marketing or, you know, what's this office doing or, or something right. like that. And it is about fit. When I was trying to find a place to land, a dear friend of mine from school encouraged me to like just put a post on Facebook. And like the particular group that my friend had suggested wasn't like I couldn't get in because I would be new and they were like clearing me or whatever. So I posted to a group that I'm pretty active in. It's like a Facebook group for queer therapists specifically. Mm -hmm. And I just like I threw it all out there and I was like, I could post this anonymously, but everybody knows me well, no, I wrote this just because like, yeah. I write how I talk yeah. a lot of times. But uh, what was interesting to me was that I put a lot in that post and Facebook limits your character. So I really had to really had to edit myself. But when I saw people respond, like practice owners respond, and I immediately knew they weren't going to be a good fit for me because we all talk, right? Like I want like, dear practice owners listening to this podcast, we talk to each <laughs> other. That's how we, <laughs> we know that your shiny website looks great. Your faces look great. Your mission, your values look great. But when I hear that, like, oh yeah, no, I had two friends there and they were overworked and unsupported. So I don't recommend. Mm. Okay, good. I'm going to tell everyone I know then. So like when people responded, like practice owners responded, and I know for a fact that their compensation plan is like 26 or more a week, or yeah. you have to see these populations. I was like, what? You didn't read my post. All you saw that was that I needed a job and yeah. you, want, you need a body. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, was that too soapboxy? I don't know if that was no, too soapboxy. No. I feel very strongly about this because this work is very important to me. This is not like a, a job you can do with like one brain lobe tied behind your back, you right. know, like it takes a lot. Well, and this is something that I see on the consultation side. And when 
when I'm consulting with practice owners, what I'm thinking about when they're having issues, personnel issues, is how much of this could have been mitigated if you would have not hired this person, if you would have had some better like mm. screening methods at the beginning. And I think right. you're exactly right. There needs to be a goodness of fit. And that puts a lot of the burden, I'm going to say, on the practice owner because employees don't know what they don't know. Right. And in my experience in the interview, the employee is right. always going to say what they think the employer wants to hear. Yes, and so the truthfully, the employer needs to say, look, I think you actually need something else. And when I think back about all right. of the people that I hired and it turned out to not work out, I recognized I was either blowing through a red flag mm -hmm. that I thought I could heal for this person, or it Ooh. was some yeah. sort of bad fit that I thought like, oh, I can just make this work instead of being really honest with myself right. and honest with the person in front of me. And I actually had a couple conversations with people where I let them go, not as a firing, but as a, you need to mm -hmm. have your own practice because you want things a certain right. way and I can't build my business around right. you, but you can do this on your own. Right, like, right, right. and I'm fine with that. Like, yeah. so let's just not have it be, you know, a fight between each other go do this. And this yeah. it's not me booting you out the right. door. It's really just, I'm seeing something in you that maybe you're not seeing in yourself or maybe yeah. you're too afraid to see. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, I love that like fostering of next steps. Like, I don't know, you know. that that's how they felt it, but <laughs> that was my intention. Right? right, right, right. Yeah. Well, that's like that Facebook post, I kind of ended it. I was just like, this feels like a psychology today profile <laughs> looking for a practice owner, like think we'd be a good fit, mm -hmm. you know, and I that, you know, it's so much of our work as therapists is about are we a good mm -hmm. fit for our clients. But and again, like if you have a kind of practice where you want, you know, you want like 60 clinicians all like, you know, hammering out the sessions for you and you have a leadership team and all that. Great. Fantastic love that for you. Bless your heart. Right. But just know that a lot of people might not fit into that. Right. Which also jumping to like, what advice would you give practice owners? Like if you get too big too fast, try and realize that because I feel like that's where us as employees, we feel it the most. Yes. Like if you don't have the infrastructure to support bringing on a bunch of new clinicians, you know, taking a bunch more insurances, like then we feel it. And that's when it's like, what am I getting out of this? I'm like stretched thin. Mm -hmm. And you want me to, you know, you want me to follow up with clients about their balances? No, <laughs> that's, not, that's like not my job. Like, but, or if you want that part of my job, great, then that's part of our mm -hmm. arrangement. But you know, that needs to be that needs to be clear. Yeah, that needs to be clear at the beginning. Yeah, yeah it's funny because right. it all practices do it different because I always wanted the clinician to have the conversation first. One, because mm -hmm. it builds it builds like the clinician's ability to tolerate having difficult conversation. And then yeah, also it yeah. makes more sense coming from the clinician rather than just a billing person coming in the side. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we have, right, and this is right. the thing that I think a lot of practice owners forget because we open businesses and we do this because we have a plethora of skills and talents and not everybody has those same skills and talents. And what feels right. obvious to me about how we should talk about money in a session is not necessarily an inherent skill, especially yeah. a new clinician coming in. So again, going right. back to like, how can we prevent these problems from happening? Let's go back to onboarding and talk about what needs to be included right. in the onboarding process so that clinicians are set up for success when they inevitably hit, you know, all of the same problems that we always hit with our clients. <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, and then like one of the very first places I worked, the initial question in the initial interview was about how do you feel about capitalism and therapy? And I was like, it fucking sucks. I mean, I didn't say that, obviously, but it's like, it's a terrible mix, but it's necessary. And so it was, it was basically like, how do you feel about talking to clients yeah. about money? And it's like, oh, well, yeah, like, it's another difficult conversation. It's part of our job. But you know, the money thing mm -hmm. is like, one of the yeah. biggest not talked about things. I mean, I've even had clients tell me, can we talk about money and therapy? I'm like, are yeah. you kidding? <laughs> One, we could talk about anything you want. You're in charge. And two, absolutely. Like this is the place to unpack all that. But also, you know, 
another instance of where we as therapists have to do our own work. Like if I feel funny talking about money, just in general, crap, I better get, I better go do some work because I'm going to have to do it. You know, and the same thing with like talking to people about like cancellations or any, any of those like difficult conversations mm-hmm. that you have to have as a therapist, not just with your clients, but with other clinicians, admin staff, things like that. Yeah. And I have I have a theory about why I think addiction counselors are better prepared for difficult conversations, but that's for a whole different podcast. Mm. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I'm 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 very elitist when it comes to the skills we get as addiction counselors. So but without digressing and we we should probably wrap this soon. (laughs) What is the best? Yeah or most important thing, or one of the most important things you want practice owners to hear? Mm. Well, I'm going to pull from one of my early mentors, one of my early supervisors, like, you know, as I was leaving a clinical internship said, know your worth, know and seek out your employees worth more Mm -hmm. than just how many clients can you see every week? just like our clients are whole people and more than just the presenting problem that they come in the door with, like your employees are whole people. And so they are bringing all of themselves to this work. And if you want, if you want them to show up as full employees, engaged and determined and hardworking, then give them the space to do that and and do what you can to keep fostering that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, it makes me really sad to think that that's not automatic in our profession, right? Yeah. yeah. I I don't know what happens. This is where I think my blinders are on because mm. I'm assuming that all practice owners try to show up the way that Andy and I try to show yeah. up is like fostering the whole person, authenticity, weirdness, no. like all of it, right? Unfortunately, no. Yeah, <laughs> right. And I, I'm guessing that a lot of people that are listening to this do, but is there right, a way, because I've noticed with myself, I'm an Enneagram three and we're all about like achievement and efficiency and getting shit done. Mm, And so I've had to notice, even though I clearly like show up and care about whoever's in front of me, I am putting the agenda first. And so in in specific relationships, I've had to be like, okay, connection first, agenda later. (laughs) So even even when you are showing up, seeing people as a full human, I'm going to invite practice owners to think, how can you do that even more without, here's the asterisk, without losing the mission of the business because what the practice owners have to hold is that I'm showing up for you as an individual employee and I'm holding the whole health of the business in two different hands. Right, right. Again, it's a job that I don't want because (laughs) that that is so so much to hold. You got to be the people person and the like the caring nurturer, right? And the supporter. And you also have to be like, brass tacks about the money coming in, keeping the lights on, keeping the paperwork up to date. Right. Like it is a lot. Yeah. 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 Well, anything else that we didn't talk about that you're like, oh my God, if I don't say this, I'm just going to explode. Oh, well, I think the the little gems, the the, the ice cream store uh, in July is like, the, and I just really appreciate what you said about like, this is not passive income. This is, this is active income. And I think like the, kind of trajectory that I've seen is like people get burnout doing all the direct service. So then they dial back their, their caseload and then decide like, oh, well, I'll just do the business stuff. But like, you really can't just be like, well, this is almost a business, right? You, you can't half-ass the business yeah. part because it's so important. So, yeah. And if you decide that, I think, was it one of your previous guests on this series, Annie Schlosser? Schusler. Maybe? Mm-hmm. Schusler, thank you. Who's it? Who said something like, oh, I, I wasn't very good at that at all. So I management or something like if you figure out that you hate it and you're not very good at it, get out. Right. Or find, right. Go, hire someone who can do the stuff right. that you don't want to do yep. and then keep doing the things you want to do. Yeah. Don't be cheap, guys. We're so <laughs> therapists are so fucking cheap. I swear to God. And I include myself what? in this, but pay. It doesn't help that we don't get raises, I right? Know. Like, like, I you know, know, oh, Blue Cross will throw us like $3 this year. Like that. 
I know. That's a, well, I know. Another discussion. Yeah. Another but paying <laughs> paying people to do like paying an accountant, paying a lawyer, right? Paying a consultant, right. all of these people that can help you cuz that helps the employees. Like I I like to think of it as sort of right. like nesting levels of care, right? So the yes. client is held by the clinician. The clinician is held by the business owner. The business owner is held by the consultant and their team. And the consultants are held right. by their team. And it's like, it's this nested nested yes. dolls of care rather than like, I am this island right. of a practice owner who has to do everything myself. That's where the employees feel it. And because right. that's what I did. <laughs> That's what I did yes. until I realized differently. <laughs> so I'm, try I'm trying to like just save everyone from my mistakes, right. which I know is not necessarily going to work. But uh, uh, here we go anyway. Right. Well, no, I'm not so appreciate, right, that you're willing to say like, hey, these are the mistakes I made. Don't make them. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, take it from me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, Cassandra, how can people find you and connect with you if they if they want to do so? Oh, yeah. Well, you can certainly find me on LinkedIn. Uh, not that I do a lot of posting or anything, but it's a great way to message me. I'm Rowan Tree Counseling. So you go to our team. I think I'm like rowantreechicago.com slash Cassandra. That's with a C and mm -hmm. two S's. Yeah, I'd love to connect. I'd love to talk shop with other clinicians out there and hear what what's working, what's not working. And that's that's my role as a therapist and a social worker is to build relationships. And, you know, I don't just think of that on the individual clinical level, but definitely out there. So please invade my inbox. I'd love to see it. Amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. And you did not disappoint in terms of the, the wisdom <laughs> that you have to offer for practice owners. Oh. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was so great. You know, we didn't talk about how we're we're kind of like this. Like you, you know, yeah. you teach at Loyola. I went to Loyola, but we never connected, right? So it's so great to finally yeah. be able to sit down with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the special Burnt Out Practice Owner series. If you want more information about today's guest, go to our website at www.headheartbiztherapy.com slash podcast. Thanks to the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, and I'm your host, Sarah Buino. Until next time, bye-bye.